Welcome to the 3C Live Experience, a dynamic, multiracial, fast-growing church with thousands of believers filled with passion for God and for people. Let's join 3C in this live experience. So this morning, we're going to get into the Word of God and we're going to be speaking about the power in the blood. Say with me, there is power in the blood. Say it with me again. There is power in the blood. We're going to be looking at the freedom, the healing, the deliverance, the redemption, the incredible miracle that we have in our new covenant with the Lord because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, you can go with me to the book of Luke chapter 22 and verse um, verse 39. It says, Coming out, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Someone say with me, Pray. pray. It says, And he was withdrawn from them, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Say with me, prayed. prayed. Saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Say with me, prayed. prayed. He prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose up from the prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping. Tell the person next to you, don't be found sleeping. Again. <laughs> then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray. Say with me, rise and pray. He said, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And we're going to be looking over the next few weeks at certain places where Jesus shed his blood. We're going to be looking at the power of the cross. You know, unfortunately, some Christians think that they can graduate from Calvary. They can graduate from the gospel where they get into many theological debates and arguments and in questions and, and in theses. But we learn and we know one thing is true, that there is power in the blood of Jesus. And that when you understand the true gospel and you have a revelation of the cross, there is no greater freedom you can have than when you know the truth because that truth will set you free. And so that's why even Peter says in, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. But in verse 19, he says, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, and without spot. In the next chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7, he writes, To you who believe, He is precious. When you have a revelation of the cross, when you have a revelation of what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross, when you have a revelation and you understand and your eyes have been opened to what Christ has done for you and me at Calvary, and you know what happened in that moment and at that event, He becomes precious to you. But to some people, even though they go to church and even though they pray every time they get into a crisis, Christ is not precious to them because they don't have a revelation of the cross. They don't have a re revelation of the Lamb of God. And that's why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus walking towards the Sea of Galilee, he shouted and he said very loudly so that all could hear, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. He is precious to us. Because we understand that it is at the cross 
that we have the great exchange. It is at the cross where the power of God is activated, where it is not your own righteousness or your own behavior that can save you. It is not your own acts. It is not your own lifestyle that can try and twist God's arm to do something for you. You can't say, well, God, look, I fasted. Look, I prayed. God, look, I went to church. God, look, I'm a good person. Look at what I gave. No, we understand that redemption is through the blood of Jesus and through the blood of Jesus alone, that the power of God doesn't come through the work of man, but it comes through what Jesus did for us on the cross. And when we put our faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross, that is when you will see the power of God start working in your life. And I'm so thankful that we're a part of a church who will never grow tired of preaching about Christ crucified. And we will talk about Him always. And we will talk about it all the time. In fact, if we ever preach a sermon without Christ, we should stop preaching. If we ever start talking about something other than what Jesus has done for us, we have lost the essence of the gospel. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, I preach Christ crucified, not with words of human wisdom, not with the power of the spoken word, not trying to intellectually convince people, but we always come back to Christ and Him crucified. Hallelujah. And so why do we keep preaching about the blood of Jesus? Why do we keep preaching about Christ and Him crucified because we're a church that doesn't want anyone to be dependent on a man, on a so-called prophet or an apostle. But we want to make sure people know where the fountain is. We want to make sure people know where the life is, know where the healing is. You don't have to pay money to get a prophecy or a healing or a miracle. You don't have to go to a Sangoma and get Muti. But you can go straight to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords yourself. You can go to Him. And the Bible says, when you call upon His name, you shall be saved. It's like someone coming to me and saying, I'm so hungry. And I heard you have all the apples, you have all the oranges, you know where the fruit is stored. If I was very selfish and had an agenda, I could just give that person an orange and say, here, here's the fruit, here's the food, eat it, be full. And when you get hungry, what are they going to have to do again? They're going to have to come back to me. But over the next four weeks, we are not going to give you the fruit, but we are going to tell you where to get the fruit. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be speaking about how to apply what Christ has done for us in your own personal life. So that you don't need a man, you don't need an institution, you don't need to go through something. Every day, you can go straight to Jesus Himself. You know, many people, when something happens, you know, a demon starts manifesting or there's a sickness, it's always, call the pastor, quickly call the pastor. But you can learn that that power is available to you. Who wants to know where the fruit is? Amen. Who wants to know where the, where the forest is, where you can get all the nourishment that you need for your life? Well, that nourishment is through the shedding of the blood of Jesus. Revelation chapter 12 and 11 says, They overcame him, him being the enemy. They overcame him through the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The blood of the Lamb they overcame. Amen. And so today we are looking at the first place that we find the beginning of the crucifixion. We are looking at the first place where Jesus had to overcome. The very first place where Jesus had to shed blood. It's crazy because this blood was not shed due to another person oppressing him or torturing him or someone stabbing him or nailing him to the cross. The very first place was produced by the very agony of the battle between his pride and the will of God. So today we can see that Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane. And where Adam failed in the garden, Jesus had to succeed in the garden. Where Adam surrendered God's will and chose his will, Jesus had to surrender his will and choose God's will. We call this place the blood of faithfulness. 
Say with me, faithfulness. faithfulness. Because the hardest battle is not the physical torture that Jesus had to go through. It wasn't the whipping. It wasn't the crown of thorns, even though that was brutal, even though that was, it was intense. The toughest battle that Jesus had to face was when he walked into that garden and he had to make a conscious decision to voluntarily give up everything he has, surrender his life, even though he had the power to save himself, he had to choose to keep his mouth shut and walk through the crucifixion. And we see that what did Jesus do in his greatest moment of agony? He prayed. He prayed. What do you do in your greatest moment of stress? What do you do when you have the biggest decisions in your life confronting you? What do you do when you are facing a crisis in your family or you are facing uh, 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 an extraordinary tragedy or trauma or, or situation in your finances or in your health? Where do you go? Because we see that the way Jesus conquered, the first thing he did when it came to the place of having to battle his will, battle the pride of life, battle the desires of the flesh, battle this nature that we have as humanity. The very first thing he did is he went to the Mount of Olives where he would usually go. And the Bible says he fell on his face and he started praying. He started praying because what we know with our sinful nature is that it is impossible for us to be faithful out of our own effort. It is impossible for us to be holy out of our own decision and strength. But Jesus went and he kneeled down and he prayed. He prayed so hard. There was so much agony and sorrow because what was the battle? The battle was between what he wanted to do and what he knew he needed to do. We actually see that the opposite is true for, for Lucifer. For Satan. I want to read to you the description of what Lucifer said when he was cast out of heaven. And how this is the opposite to the Spirit of God. This is what a sinful nature sounds like. And it's in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And we're going to read from verse 12. He says, sorry, let me get it here. There you go. Isaiah 14 verse 12. He says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Can you see the opposite attitude and spirit between Lucifer and evil and, and, and Jesus himself. Jesus, in the deepest, darkest point of his life, the night that he knows he will be arrested, the night he knows he will be crucified, the night he knows he will be betrayed and rejected by the very people he has come to save, he says a prayer that sounds like this, not my will. Not my will. He surrenders his will. He surrenders his pride. He surrenders what he desires, what he wants. But do you hear what was in Lucifer's heart before he was cast out of heaven? I will ascend. I will be like God. I will sit at the, at the top of the congregation. I will be like the Most High. I will, because that is the sound of pride. And it's funny because you hear a lot of Christians speak exactly the same way. All they do is add in Jesus' name at the end. Because they say stuff like, I will 
in Jesus' name. I will in Jesus' name. But it is still coming from a place of pride. And just like Jesus, the greatest battle that we face is that battle of our will versus the will of God. That is the definition of faithfulness. Because remember, my friend, that when we are standing at judgment, when we will all stand before God, when He will look at our lives and look at what we have done with the gift that He has given us, remember that God is not going to be looking for your achievements and your accolades. He says, well done, good and faithful. Good and faithful. Where Jesus says throughout Scripture, if you are faithful with a little, God will appoint you over much. So God is not impressed by secular success. He's not impressed by materialism that is accumulated into your net worth. God is looking at the heart and at the true heart is faithfulness there. Is faithfulness there? Are you faithful? It is impossible to be faithful without the Spirit of God within us, without the nature of God. And that is why, thank God, that Jesus defeated this battle of pride. Because I don't know if you know, but when you become a child of God, everything that is Christ is now you. The Spirit of Christ now lives in you. Because your sins have been removed. Because your sins have been forgiven. Because He was the ransom on our behalf. Now the Spirit of Christ lives in us. And because of the Spirit of Christ in us, we can too defeat pride in our lives. Isn't it amazing that the crucifixion didn't start at the cross, but it started in the garden. And where Adam and Eve chose their will over God's, Jesus showed, how, showed us how to defeat pride by choosing God's will over ours. As a child of God, are you living in God's will for your life? Or are you living in your will but hoping that God will bless it? Are you living in God's plan? Are you living according to His statutes? Are you living in God's design? Because that's where the freedom is. That's the beginning. That's where the deliverance is. Unfortunately, you will not experience the fullness of the blessing of God until you come to a place like Christ. Come to a place where you surrender your will to God. And say, Lord, not my will. And you know, many people can pray that. And many people can say that. But when you look at the agony Jesus went through, it is one thing to say it, it's another thing to live it. And the only way to live with the fruit of faithfulness in your life is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon your life is if you know how to apply the blood of Jesus. We call it the great exchange. Remember, you can quickly tell in your life whether you are a faithful person or not. It's not about how you act on the outside. It's about the heart. And if you are unfaithful in one area, it means you are unfaithful in all areas. You know, David, when he was unfaithful in his marriage, in, in Psalm 51, didn't say, I was unfaithful to you. He said to God, God, it is, to, it is against you that I have sinned. Because David knows being unfaithful in his marriage simply means he is an unfaithful man. You cannot be unfaithful in one area and say that you are faithful to God. Because salt water and pure water cannot flow out of the same fountain. You have one heart. So you cannot be caught up in adultery and think you are faithful in the kingdom of God. You cannot be unfaithful in your finances and think you are faithful in the kingdom of God. You cannot be unfaithful in, with your family or with the job that you have. If you are corrupt at work, it means you are unfaithful to God. And this type of living, 
this type of purity, this type of sanctified living that brings you into the fullness of His blessing, the fullness of His deliverance. You see, because when you are unfaithful, you open up the door for the enemy to have his way in your life. But when you walk in the faithfulness of God, His blessing is evident wherever you go. The bad news is that none of us can be faithful out of our own strength. The good news, what's another word for good news? The gospel is that Jesus died on the cross so that we can be set free from our own sin and walk in this faithfulness that we know we were created to walk in. The cross is a place of exchange. Say with me, exchange. exchange. Jesus died on the cross and his hands were nailed. And I want you to picture it like this. That on the one side, he absorbs your sinful nature. He absorbs the areas of your life that are not from God. And on the other hand, he gives you and releases and, and replaces those sinful attributes with His Spirit and with His attributes. It is at the cross where the God nature comes in and our sinful nature is exchanged. It is at the cross where we give up the curse of our sin, the wickedness in our hearts, the unfaithfulness in our DNA, and a miracle takes place. And it is a great miracle, the greatest miracle. People, because of our logic, have not yet realized the greatest miracles are not the ones that are physical. It's where the heart of man is transformed. Where a wicked, unfaithful, full of selfish desire man in one moment can be transformed into a faithful man of integrity and love. That is what happens at the cross when we are born again. And so I'm going to ask us, we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to do some confessions of exchange today. Is that okay? Let's all stand together. And today, I want you there we are, just close your eyes and become aware of God's presence. And Lord, we surrender our will today. We don't want to be like Lucifer. We don't want to be like Satan. We don't want that wicked heart that says, I will, I will, I will. But we want to be like you, Jesus. We want to have the love that you had that says, not my will. Not my will. Not my will, Lord. Not my will but yours be done. And if you know that you need to come to that place of surrender, just there we are. Just lift your hands to the Lord and just speak to the Lord there where you are. And say, Lord, today I choose to surrender. I choose to give it over to you. I've been doing it my way. But today I say, not I will, but your will. Not I will, but your will in my life. Oh, forgive me, Lord, for the pride of my heart. Forgive me, Lord, for the unfaithfulness of my life. Even where people don't see, but you know the true me. You know who I am behind closed doors. You know who I am when no one is watching. And Lord, I don't want to be like that. I don't want a wicked heart behind a persona. I don't want to have an appearance of godliness. I want to be godly. I surrender today. I surrender today. Won't you say this with me? Say, I come before the cross. And I apply the blood of Jesus that was shed in the garden of Gethsemane where he conquered today by faith through my confession I will conquer 
Now say this with me. Thank you, Jesus. You absorb my pride. You remove it. And you replace it with humility. You absorb my stubbornness. You remove it. And replace it with servanthood. You absorb my rebellion. You remove it. And replace it with obedience. You absorb all infidelity. You remove it. And replace it with commitment. You absorb my disloyalty. You remove it. And replace it with loyalty. You absorb all dishonor. You remove it from my life. And replace it with honor. You absorb my selfishness. Through your blood. You remove it. And replace it with trustworthiness. You absorb my unfaithfulness. Say it again. You absorb my unfaithfulness. You remove it. And you replace it with faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that through the cross, I can receive your nature. Say with me, I am faithful. Because he, because he is faithful. Come on, believe it. Say, I am, I am faithful, faithful. Because, he is faithful. because he is faithful. And there we are. Just thank him in your own words. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The work is done in our hearts at the cross where there is freedom by the blood, where there is deliverance in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that the work at the cross it is complete, it is finished, and we can receive your nature in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I want to ask you, there we are, just to keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. And I want to invite you today, if you are here this morning and you have never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Whichever campus you are watching from, if you're watching online, you as well. If you know your life is not right with God, but you say today, I want to make a decision to give my life to God. I want to come back home. I want to be a child of God. If you've never done that, I want to give you that invitation right now. Remember that going to church, trying to be good, calling yourself a Christian doesn't make you a child of God, but it's the day you make a personal decision that no one else can make for you, where you put your faith in what Christ has done for you on the cross. And when you make that confession, where you surrender your life to Him, a miracle takes place. His Spirit comes into your heart and you will now be called a child of God. And so when I count to three, if that is you today and you say, I want to give my life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand with no one watching, no one looking around. If you are ready to take that bold step, you know God has been speaking to you. God has been speaking to your heart, but you've been running away. But you say, this is the moment. Today is the day. I am ready for the freedom that is in Christ. I need my sins to be forgiven. I want to come back home. If that is you, quickly right now, slip up your hand. One, two, three. Put it up high and we're going to pray together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see those hands. I see those hands on the side, at the back. Just put your hands up. Let me see. Thank you. You can put your hands down again. I'm going to ask one more time. Maybe you backslidden. You know what I'm talking about. You are disconnected, fallen away. Everything's grown cold. But you say, today I'm coming back. Today my faith is being resurrected. I need to recommit my life to Jesus. If that is you, don't miss out on this opportunity right now. God is speaking to you. God is calling you. And so I'm going to ask one more time. If you've not lifted up your hand, but you say, I want to join those who already have. I want to give my life to Jesus. Quickly do it right now. One, two, three. Put up your hand. And we're going to pray together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you so much. You can put your hand down. Now I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. If you lifted up your hand, it's so important that we pray with you. And I want to pray with you face to face. And I want you to see this as stepping out of your old life and into your new life. So right here and at every campus, if you lifted up your hand, quickly right now, come out of the aisle. Come stand right in front. We're going to pray together before we close the service. Quickly come. Don't be shy. Come on, come on, come on. Thank you, Jesus. If you're right in front, I want you just to close your eyes. We're going to pray. If you're watching online, there we are. Just put your hand on your heart. We're going to pray this together. And church, let's all pray this with those who are in front. Say with me, Jesus, here I am. I need you in my life. Today I decide to answer your call to come back home. And I believe that you died on that cross and rose again so that I can have a new life. Come into my heart, Lord. Fill me with your Spirit. Forgive my sin. Cleanse me. Purify me. Give me a new heart. Thank you that from this moment, it's a new life. It's a new beginning. And I know that you are with me every step I take. I'm going to follow you with all that I have. And I can declare, I am a child of God. I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This 3C Live experience was brought to you by the 3C Media Production. For more information, Call us on 086-111-2345 or log on to my3c.tv. Or you could write to us at P.O. Box 10508 Centurion 0046 or email us at tv at my3c.tv. If you need prayer, SMS the word PRAY followed by your prayer request to 33347 and our team of prayer warriors will pray for you for 30 days. If you would like to become a partner with the ministry, SMS the word PARTNER to 33347 and one of our team members will get back to you within the next few days. You can follow Pastors Bert and Shane Pretorius on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to be inspired daily by morning devotions, ministry updates and much, much more. Log on to my3c.tv for more information.